Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back. Um, and we're going to jump right back in where we left off yesterday and the day before and the day before. I'm, again, very appreciative of the great feedback we're getting on this series. I, th- I think you guys are, um, I think you're really ready for the new year. That's the sense I'm getting based on the feedback. You're excited about it. You're realizing that you are in the right place at the right time in the right industry. And to further reinforce that, there were two really interesting data points that came out today about the real estate market in general um, that I wanted to share with you prior to getting to the next point, which is point number five. And uh, the first one was, is you can get an, uh, uh, on mortgage interest rates, you can get a mortgage interest uh, of 28 Seven percent now, two point eight seven percent on the on a thirty year fixed rate mortgage. Now that's extraordinary. I mean, if you think about that, that is amazing. And if homes continue to appreciate or increase in value like they have been, some would argue that it's inflation, uh, including yours truly. But if they continue to increase in value at the rate that they have been, if you can get lock in a long term thirty year rate uh, mortgage for three percent, and you know your house is increasing in value every year by significantly more than that, or even just even if it's only three percent, you're essentially living in that house for free. So I want you to really consider the fact that unlike maybe years in the past where it maybe made sense to have your house paid off, maybe in this inflationary era, inflationary era that we're entering into, it's maybe better off to have some debt on that house with the money practically being free. So there's that. That's a little bit of a paradigm shift, but it also creates an interesting opportunity for a lot of people maybe that were or, um, you know, maybe we're on the fence and worried about they should pay their house off and they should stay put and see the, the rules with regards to the economy because of the nature of, uh, frankly, some of the Fed rate policy changes. It's going to really kind of cause a lot of people to see an opportunity to move up in homes. And that's what is uh, probably going to happen for at least the next five years. But there's another little interesting data point that came out that I thought was really fascinating. Home sales. Now get this, listeners. Home sales are the highest point that they've been since 2005. <laughs> Think about that. Here we are in this crazy year where we've had all these you know, really historic things happen, to put it mildly, and home sales are one of the only bright spots in the overall economy after all of this you know, malaise that's happened this year with COVID. And home sales continue to be just absolute you know, leaders in the economy. And what you're going to see, and uh, Julie and I have been writing a lot of articles about this on our main website, timandjulieharris.com, is it didn't really matter who the president was going to be, whether it's Trump or Biden, what, uh, because both their, home, their housing policies were virtually identical. And I'll give you, I'll summarize it. Um, housing is good. Let's make it so as many people can buy a house as possible. So, and you, there's a fourth element that's going on now, which you're really starting to see even more so than in the past, is this big demographic shift that's happening. So all these reasons and more, by the way, I'm working on a um, series of 10 points why, uh, you know, for a future podcast, 10 points why the next five years are going to be the best five years in the history of real estate in the United States. Uh, I just gave you probably points one through four. But the moral of the story here is you guys are in the right place at the right time. And yes, I understand that maybe you're feeling like you've been burning your candle at both ends for a while because of what a crazy year this has been. Um, And, you know, no, I get it. And that's fine. And it totally makes sense that you want to say, for example, take next week off because it's Thanksgiving. And you should, you know, honestly, you should. You should give yourself an opportunity to catch your breath. You should give yourself an opportunity to unplug. The nice thing about, you know, being in real estate is kind of a double-edged sword, right? You got into real estate originally because you wanted freedom, you know, essentially freedom from having a boss in essence, right? You wanted to be able to control your own schedule and you wanted to make uh, as much money as you chose to. Well, the first two things are easy to accomplish, right? You get your license, boom, you're self-employed and there is no boss and there is no one telling you what to do, when to do it, right? Now, the problem is, is the third thing never really seems to materialize for very many people, which is the money aspect of it. So as you kind of enter, if you're entering into, um, you know, a nice break, hopefully you're taking some time off next week and you're entering into that time of year where you're in appreciation mode, hopefully you're you know, showing gratitude towards the people that helped to, uh, you know, we were part of your life for the last 12 months and, you know, all the good stuff that happens during the holidays. I want you to really think about the fact 
that if indeed the next five years is going to be the best five years of not just housing, but your own personal life, your own personal professional life primarily, right? So if you know for sure that the next five years were going to be your best five years of your life in terms of helping people and making money, like there's no doubt about it. There's no debate. There's no room for skepticism. That is just what it was going to be. Next five years is going to be your best five years ever. What kind of thoughts would you be having about your potential, right? Isn't that a fun question? So just say that to yourself out loud. Just seriously, I want you to do it. I know for a fact that the next five years are going to be the best five years of my life. I mean, say it. Right now, if that's true, if that potential is there to be true, then what should you be what what should you be, you be planning? What should you be doing? What should you be stopping doing? And so, as you go through again, as you're sort of winding down emotionally and taking a little bit of a breath, some of you more than others, some of you maybe more uh, should not be so uh, recumbent at this time because you are missing what really is for many people the best time of year to be generating listing leads in particular because there are um, you know the fact that. There are so many agents that aren't working this time of year. The agents that are working this time of year uh, have less competition. It's easier for them to pick up listings in particular, old expires, things like that. But you can listen to past podcasts on those topics or join our coaching program. But what I'm focusing on here is that the reality is, is that what you experience in the next five years, and let's just keep it maybe more, you know, small, 2021, what you experience in the next year is greatly determined by the thoughts and the, the actions that you take right now. And so the, the point of the podcast since uh, last Sunday was to help all of you realize that it really is in your control what you get out of this life. It really is in your control out of uh, essentially what you experience in your real estate practice for next year. It really is in your control if you allow yourself to slip back into overwhelm and stress. And so that's where I left it off yesterday on uh, point number four. And now point number five is kind of an interesting thing. There's a lot of sub points at this point, but I think it's going to, if you guys write these down and you, if you're longtime listeners to uh, this podcast, you know that Julie and I, and Julie, by the way, is almost done with her CE. So hopefully she'll be back on the show tomorrow. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you listen to us, you know, we don't like to go too deep into the we like to focus on things that are practical and tactical. So point number five, and I'm going to read this point to you, and then I'll give you the sub points. Set boundaries on your time and workload. And I'm going to even go expand that point from when I wrote it. Set boundaries on what you allow to influence you. And I want you to think about that. So set boundaries on your time and workload and set boundaries on the things that you allow to influence you. The last part is um, more of a challenge because then the next question is, is, Tim, how do I go about deciding what or who is going to influence me? Who do I choose to allow to influence me? And I, we've, again, talked about this in previous podcasts, but really the answer is it's kind of like a three-pronged approach. When you're trying to take on a, a real or imaginary mentor or you're trying to you know, decide what, who you're going to listen to for guidance in your business or personal life, you've got to start setting filters in place. And don't just uh, assume that the person who's offering their advice or their direction is really qualified to give it to you because we're in this era, this time of fake experts. Like you can call yourself an expert just because there is no criteria to be an expert. It's like this whole influencer thing that's going on in the world, right? Someone's an influencer. Well, what does that even really mean? Well, it's because they decided they were an influencer or they decided they were an expert. It's kind of like in my industry, right? It, there's no criteria to call yourself a coach. And that's the reason every third agent is a coach because they just, well, I guess I'm going to be a coach. What does that really mean if you're thinking about hiring that person to be your coach? Or what does that really mean if you're thinking about taking advice from that person, you need to be very, very selective on who you allow in your head because if you're not, you're going to have a lot of competing information from people that frankly weren't qualified to give you advice in the first place. Does that sound self-serving? Maybe it does, but the reality of it is it's also true. And I think if you think about it through a, a lens of practical and tactical, you'll realize what I'm saying is true. So the first criteria I would suggest when you're deciding if you're going to take advice from somebody, it's about building your real estate business or maybe getting back in shape or saving money. The first criteria, and, and this would be the one, you know, most people are going to not even pass this first filter, the first criteria, is have you actually done it, <laughs> right? I know it seems like it should be a very basic requirement when you're thinking about hiring somebody. Like if you wanted to hire somebody, I'm about the most unathletic person you're ever going to meet. And I've tried to take tennis lessons before, but I'm partially blind to my right eye. 
And as being partially blind in my right eye, I have a depth perception issue. So I can only see a depth, like my depth perception only kicks in when something's maybe within like six feet in front of me. And beyond that, I can't perceive how far that thing is. I don't know how to describe it other than that. I've lived like this my entire life, right? I was born with this. It's no big deal. I don't even notice it, right? I can, I've worked around it. My brain's figured out pathways. But the point of it is, is I'm not athletic. But if I chose to take tennis lessons, right, <laughs> which would be the bane of my existence, because again, there's a strange ball that's going to be coming at me and I'm not going to know when to swing the, the uh, racket. But if I wanted to, given all my you know, limiting factors that are real, I would look for somebody who actually had not just taught tennis before, but someone who had competed and won in tennis before. I would look for someone that was the absolute best, not again at teaching, because teaching and having doing are two different things. It is incredibly rare that you run across anyone that did it and then teaches it at the same level that they actually did it. Most people you'll find are essentially, they'll teach or they'll coach, but they never actually did it. So the difference between using somebody, hiring somebody that's did it, that actually coaches or trains and per- versus someone who's never actually performed at a high level is night and day. And you know when you see it, you know it when you hear it, but you will oftentimes settle for essentially convenience. You're not going to be restrictive enough on who you take advice from. So when you're trying to decide if you're going to hire a particular coach or trainer or, an, you know, like I said, a tennis lesson guy or gal, make sure you determine have they actually not just taught lessons, but have they actually, you know, played tennis at a, at a high level where they actually ranked, for example, or in the real estate realm, there are so many agents out there that hire coaches that never have actually sold a lot of real estate. They've never actually done it at a high level. So agents will just summarily you know, assume that this person knows what they're talking about, but it turns out that they don't because they never actually did it. So they're in the business of trying to sell you something, not necessarily in the business of trying to sell you something that's going to actually work. So the next criteria I would have is obviously the first one is have you actually done it? The second one I just touched on it is you did you do it at a high level? And the third criteria is did you do it at a high level for a long period of time? That's it. So have you done it? Did you do it at a high level? And did you do it at a high level for a long period of time? Because again, if you haven't, if you, for example, were a, a tennis pro, and you you know you won a couple matches and you that was it that was your whole career you hit this you know high point it lasted about two weeks and then you're out okay that's not the person I'm going to want to hire to give me really good advice it's kind of like if you're hiring somebody to help you organize your finances same criteria you know has this person actually you know truly successfully successful financially and have they been for a long period of time right? Is this just something that they're saying or claiming? Prove that you actually, if you claim that you're going to be someone who's going to manage my money, prove that you're actually successful at it. Prove that you've been successful for a long period of time. These are the types of rules that you need to start applying to everything when you're taking in advice from anyone. And that includes media. That includes the books you read and the things you allow to influence you. The reason that this is so important is because we're so inundated with fake experts and fake influencers. We're so inundated constantly from everywhere you go. You're barraged with you know, unsolicited, free, usually worthless advice. But unless you have filters in place, rules in place, you will oftentimes find yourself aligning your thinking and thus your actions with frankly, bad advice. And you got to be really, really uh, crazily uh, particular about that. Napoleon Hill in his book, Think and Grow Rich, talks about this. Um, And this is something, you know, I think should be innate to all of you. All of you should naturally know this. But in case you don't, well, now you do. Those are your three filters. All right, so set boundaries on your time and workload. Have a real schedule, at least in the AM. I touched on that yesterday. Make the schedule focused on the things that are going to put you in a position to help people and make money. I touched on that yesterday. Now, point number six, Stop trying to solve other people's problems. Stop trying to solve other people's problems. <laughs> How many of you uh, have these relationships with people? Maybe it's fellow real estate agents where it's all predicated on basically you being their Dr. Phil. How's that working out for you? 
right? I mean, that's a Dr. Phil quote right there. But that is one of the things that a lot of people fall prey to because they will essentially, the person seeking the advice doesn't really want to listen to what you have to say. They're just basically trying to distract themselves or pull you into some way of thinking that, you know, essentially is probably defective for the most part. Otherwise, they wouldn't be having that particular issue, right? So do yourself a favor. And if you're now in a, a position where you're constantly giving free advice, stop trying to stop doing that. Stop trying to solve other people's problems. It's not really your role. And what that does is it distract. Now, I'm not talking about your real estate customers, obviously, but it distracts you from what is the most important thing to you. It distracts you from your goals. It gets into your head and it causes you again to feel burnout and stress because you're seeing that you're having these people in your life who are bringing you these problems and these problems never seem to go away. And then you start thinking that maybe the the lack of resolution of their problems is your fault. And you guys see how that's another a vortex of negative thinking. That's where it all starts and stops. It's these little tiny, you know, directional changes you can make. And then when you make these changes, you're going to find that you will be a lot happier. Now I'm going to make this very practical and tactile for the sake of business. Let's say for example, you're a broker, you're a team manager, you're you're a, you know, whatever you are, you're somebody who other people go to for advice, for guidance, for coaching, maybe, right? Now, here's a little rule that you do. If you basically have a quote unquote, open door policy, ask me any question, any time, you will never, ever get anything important done because people are going to be using the, the excuse that they're going to go to Bob for advice as their excuse not to do what they don't want to do and they don't want to do at the highest level. In other words, they will happily burn up all your time sit in your office or pull you on a phone or a Zoom call and talk to you endlessly about all their challenges it just because what they're trying to do is they're rationalizing that that's work. In other words, they're wasting your time, taking your life energy away for the sake of essentially their being an effectively uh, ineffective and maybe even a little bit lazy. And I know that's a little harsh, but it's also true. So here's a system that I'll suggest all of you put in place, especially if you're in a formal uh, position of being a, a boss of any sort. When somebody has a problem, you, you can even make this into a form. And we, this is part of our coaching program too. We teach you how to do this. But it's very simple. You can just make your own form. When somebody has a question or a problem or a challenge or it does not matter what, okay, it does not matter. They have to fill out a form. It can be a digital form. You can use like Google Forms or it can be a paper form. Julie and I did this when we had our real estate business, by the way, this is the way we did it. So you write down what your problem is and then you write down three solutions. <laughs> That's it. So you write down your problem. I cannot or I'm having challenges with, or this is a problem for me because, and then you, as the person filling out the form, has to write out three solutions. And you will not, as the leader or the boss, even consider reading the form until the form is completely filled out. Because here's what you'll discover. 99% of the time, the person who was going to happily waste hours of your life with their particular challenge, when told to fill out the form ahead of time, they won't even... Uh, they won't fill out the form because they know what they were going to do is just waste time anyway. And they're not going to fill out the form because they don't want to put in the effort, even though, you know, had you not had this policy in place, they'd have been happily taking all your free time, right? So the form in itself for the people that are actually challenged by something will help them self-discover their own solutions, will then also then make them less dependent on you to solve all their problems. And again, I know this is a paradigm that a lot of people get caught in where they think they're responsible for solving other people's problems. And maybe you're using that yourself if you're this universal problem solver. Maybe you've put that uh, your, yourself in that position. So you're the one that can avoid doing what you don't want to do and you don't want to do at the highest level. Maybe by you being the universal problem solver. That's your identity. And what it's really doing is it's covering up because it's taking all your time, all this problem solving for other people, this these constant dependent relationships you're manifesting everywhere. Maybe you're doing that intentionally to you know essentially hide from whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing. So it kind of goes both ways, doesn't it? So I want you to think about that. Again, the theme from last, you know, this week is how to move past feeling overwhelmed and overstressed. And that's a really you know key point there because I see that concept Constantly, especially with real estate folks, because where a lot of us are naturally caring and you know loving and wanting to contribute to other people and wanting to help other people, um, and it does make you feel good when somebody asks your advice, and that's you know you got to realize that it's an ego trigger. So if I come up to you and I say, Sally, 
I've got some, I got, I need your advice on something. Just the very words of somebody asking you for your advice makes you feel good, makes you feel important. And so maybe you've, again, you've created this world for yourself where people are constantly going to you and asking you for your advice. And as a result of that, you've gotten kind of addicted to the little ego hit from all these people making you feel important. I've seen that again happen. You know, that's a normal thing. A lot of office managers and now why, you know, who knows why ultimately the psychology behind someone not wanting to have any time to work on their own challenges and issues, but ultimately it just comes back to procrastination, which leads to my next point. Not perfectly, but close enough. Point number seven, challenge your perfectionism. Perfectionism can lead us to make tasks or projects bigger than they need to be, which can lead to procrastination, psychological distress. As things pile up, the sense of overwhelm grows, which can lead to more procrastination and more overwhelm. Shel Sandberg famously said, done is better than perfect. I love that quote. It's actually in our book too, Harris Rules. Done is better, better than perfect. No one good is good enough by asking yourself, what is the marginal benefit of spending more time on this task or project? Is, uh, is there an, if the answer is very little, stop what you're doing and be done with it. Part of this is also recognizing we cannot do everything perfectly. Now, Julie, if she were on the podcast today, is a, uh, I'd say she's a perfectionist in recovery. And a lot of you guys are the same way. So perfectionism is, and this is what Julie would say. So, you know, uh, this is the essence of that she self-discovered when she was trying to move past her tendency to per, uh, to uh, be a perfectionist. It's just procrastination. It's exactly what I, what I just uh, read to you. And so what's the essence of, per, you know, perfectionism? Perfectionism is somebody who says, I will get ready when I have got my PLTP done, when I've got my listing presentation done, when I've practiced my scripts, when I've got my office organized, when I've got this, got this, got this, got this, got this. Long list of things to do that are never quite ready. Now, why does somebody do that? The answer is very simple. They don't move forward past the getting ready to get started phase because of the fact that they don't want to do what they don't want to do when they don't want to do it. In other words, they're trying to avoid doing the real work of real estate. They don't want to actually learn how to pick up the phone. They don't actually move past their perfectionism and they're using more projects as their excuse. And again, the world is awash with reasons to procrastinate because you always can be told that there's something else you need to do. Hey, Bob, do you have your branding done? Hey, Bob, have you done your website? What about this? What about that? What about the other thing? Oh, you can't can't go after sellers until you've got these 15,000 things done, right? Now, I'm going to remind you that Julie and I, and I know we're freaks, but in our first year in the business, with having no previous real estate experience or really any sales experience whatsoever, sold over 100 houses. And the way we did it is very simple. We did not wait we just got started. We took massive action. And I cannot say we uh, maintained that level, of, that intense level of massive action for the last you know, almost 30 years of working together and being married. But I have to tell you, we have pretty, pretty much consistently done it. Not 100%, but probably 85% realistically. There's certainly been times when we've gotten a little bit procrastinating. It happens to all of us. But that it, for many people, it becomes a lifestyle. For many people, and I'll tell you, like when Julie and I get an email from somebody, that has a bunch of designations or has a bunch of titles or just a bunch of extra stuff, that extracurricular real estate learning designation things that they've been filling their days with. There are almost is a, an undeniable <laughs> and obvious direct correlation between the number of designations that somebody has. Some of you are going to be offended, but just hear me out, and the amount of money that person makes. In other words, more designations means less money because what they're doing, not in all cases, but in most cases, is they're spending their time doing other things other than the real work of real estate. You are a salesperson. Yes, you are. If you don't believe me, what does your license say? Your license with your state says real estate salesperson. In almost all 50 states, that's what it says. So that's what you are. You're a real estate salesperson. And when I had an active license, that's what I was. Julie's got an active license and that's what she is. We're salespeople. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so your challenge is to become the best version of yourself as a salesperson. You can call yourself something else, but it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, your job is to sell something. All selling is, is an effectively an art and a science of helping, of solving other people's problems. That's really all you're doing. A salesperson, a good salesperson, now there are certainly a lot of crappy salespeople, but a good salesperson is a problem solver. And I'll share this with you as well. The most successful people in the history of humanity in arts and sciences, and I was about to say politics, but I'm not going to use that anymore, and just business, and it does not matter, education, whatever facet of life you can possibly imagine, 
All of them, all the most successful of them have been salespeople. There are no exceptions. You cannot be a successful doctor unless you're a great salesperson. Well, maybe a successful doctor you can be, but you can't certainly be the best without being a great salesperson. And I can give you example after example after example. But the point being is if you want to accomplish anything significant in life, you have to embrace the fact that job number one is seeing yourself as a salesperson. Job number two is learning how to basically master your craft so people will want to use you and use the services you're offering, whatever it is. Be it, you know, like I said, maybe you're a dentist, right? You are not going to be very successful at being a dentist if you are not a good salesperson. Uh, by being a good salesperson, what do I mean? You have to make people want to use you, use your dental services, right? That's called sales skills. You have to make it so that when they're in your chair and you're trying to sell them procedures, that's called sales skills. That's what you have to have. It's how you say it. It's what you say. It's not just the ability to clean teeth and fix teeth, dental issues. It's also the ability and primarily the ability to actually sell people into you doing the procedures for them. If you, you might be, again, the best dentist ever, like, you know, the dentist that was, I won't, well, again, this would be a thing for Julie to talk about. You guys remember that cartoon where one of the elves is, um, see, this is what happens when you have a seven-year-old. One of the elves is a dentist. Remember that one? I forget the name of it. Julie will remember. Some of you remember right now, right? So you might be the best dentist ever, like absolutely the best practitioner of dental art, artistry ever to live on planet Earth. But if you cannot sell people into using your services, you will never basically be a truly successful dentist. That same thing applies for being a real estate salesperson. So a lot of times the issues that hold you back from becoming really successful are really floating around in this little conversation we've been having because you don't see yourself as a salesperson because you think the word salesperson is is bad because you haven't made the connection that hopefully I just gave to you guys. And if I did give you that connection and you do get it and you are having a little aha moment, here's the next step of that aha moment. It is your goal, your mission in life to become the best version of yourself as a salesperson, which means you naturally are going to have to learn the sales skills that are required, what to say, how to say it, how to present that are going to make people want to use you and use your real estate services. Once you've put all these thoughts together and you don't fight with them anymore, it's very liberating because then you have a very clear path forward and you're not so easily manipulable by somebody telling you, oh no, you have to be a home counselor or, uh, I mean, all these other types. I see agents... Uh, cards, well, not so much, you know, in the past year, but I used to see agents' cards, and when Julie and I would do events, and they'd give us their card and whatever, and I just see all these, like every time, I, some you guys know me, so sometimes I wouldn't be able to keep my mouth shut, but I get this card with some elaborate, you know, floral description of what the hell it is, you know, other than a real estate agent that they are, you know, luxury home assigner or some crazy ass thing, and I'll say to them, I'll say, what does this even mean? I don't even, I literally don't know what you do. And they're like, well, I'm trying to differentiate myself in the marketplace. By confusing the marketplace as to what it is that you do, yes, you are differentiating yourself. That is true. So keep things pure. Keep things as they actually are. Keep things, you go to a doctor, you want the doctor, right? So you guys got to keep things really pure in your head because, again, these are the types of confusing, think the levels of confusion that will, or levels of thinking that will cause a confusion that will cause you to feel overwhelmed. So hopefully all this makes sense. I'm going to give you guys one more point. Outsource or delegate. Ask what is the best use of my time. Activities that don't fall within that answer uh, can be taught or delegated to others. Now, I'm going to give you a couple rules with delegation. I, got, I hope you guys write these down. Delegate, don't up, up, is it ab, yeah, delegate, don't abdicate. Delegate, don't abdicate. That is a Tim Harris original. I'm quite proud of it. Delegate, don't abdicate. Now, what does that mean? It means that you delegate something, <clears throat> but you make sure that it gets done. The mistake, again, a lot of business owners will make is they'll delegate something, but then they don't track that it's actually done. Now, if you're lucky, you'll get people around you that you don't actually have to monitor that closely, but you have to monitor close enough that you can make sure things are getting done to the level that you want to have them done by. And I'll go as far as to say, and I believe this, there's nothing wrong with being a micromanager. Matter of fact, some of the most successful people I've ever known are micromanagers. Now, what they do is they create systems around uh, essentially micromanaging the people that they're delegating things to. And again, once you get people that are highly efficient, you don't have to have necessarily have those systems in place. But a, a, a dysfunctional teams, which are most real estate teams and brokerages and whatnot, is the agents will delegate and they think there's some sort of like um, 
delegation in real estate is actually kind of a hilarious topic to me and to my other su uh, sub point because most agents will delegate something that they don't know how to do. Now, I have no problem with that when it comes to non-sales activities. But where agents will make a mistake is they'll delegate, for example, they'll hire someone to call for sale by owners for them or they'll hire someone to call their centers of influence and past clients because not, as, not so much because they're busy but because they don't know how to do it and don't know how to do it is also the same thing as they feel uncomfortable doing it so they delegate it. So what agents will try to do is they'll delegate the most important things in their business, which means that they're essentially making the most important things in their business something that they never actually know how to do because they never developed the skills and how to do them in the first place. And yes, I'm talking about proactive lead generation. I'm talking about pre-qualifying. I'm talking about presenting, negotiating, and closing. When you do those five tasks at the highest level, here's the bottom line, never delegate those five tasks. I don't care how successful you become. You, you can delegate a lot of other things. We talked about the Fred Gross um, Big Rocks Theory yesterday on the podcast. Go back and listen to that. But at the end of the day, you do not delegate the things that get you paid. And these are the highest skilled things that when you get really good at them, you're going to find that you make a tremendous amount of money, frankly. if you Once you accept the fact that you have to proactively lead generate, which means no more buying leads, you have to pre-qualify the leads yourself. You know, you have to present yourself. You have to negotiate yourself and close yourself. When you can do all those things at a very, very high level and you do all those things around the activity of listing homes, that is the secret sauce for real estate right there. But again, a lot of agents, they'll delegate and they'll delegate, you know, look, delegate pounding signs, right? Delegate doing home inspections. Delegate maybe even, obviously, delegate your TC work. Delegate all that other stuff. Delegate feedback. Delegate just all kinds of little minutiae activities as you start doing more transactions. But don't delegate the things that matter the most. Um, if you want to know how to instantly increase your income, I'm going to give you a little little uh, you know advanced coaching here that should seem super obvious. All you've got to do is start calling your leads back urgently. And so what we know in our book, we call it furiously fast lead follow-up. So I have furiously fast lead follow-up. And by furiously fast lead follow-up, I mean like within a minute or less. When you do that, you're going to absolutely blow away the person who just called about asking for the information. If someone emails you, okay, and you cannot find their phone number, which, you know, nowadays it's almost impossible not to find their phone number, but if for some reason all you get is a textual form of communication from them, I want you to text them back something very nice asking, well, obviously if they text you, you're going to have their phone number, but if they, if they emailed you and you don't have their phone number, email them back something very nice and then ask for their phone number. If you cannot get their phone number, that's a crappy lead you know, set it aside. Now, you'll have to adjust accordingly, but the takeaway is I want you to know that you have to be able to call them. Calling them is what you must do. If you cannot call somebody, they're not that serious. If they don't want to talk to you, they're not that serious. And do not think that just dropping them into a, a drip campaign is going to somehow cure the lack of actual lead follow-up. It's not. You move past these tendencies. So like delegating, right? We were just talking about that a second ago. When you delegate your lead follow-up, for example, to a CRM, you just lost the whole game. Long-term lead follow-up has proven in every single study ever done to be a complete waste of time. So expensive it is and such a time waste that it is, not to mention all the other you know, cost of, from doing long-term lead follow-up. But the biggest one from a coach's perspective I see that really I think I wish the industry would you know shine a light on is that a lot of agents, agents with the most leads are almost always the least, are making the least amount of money and helping the fewest people. The more leads you have, again, it's like designations, right? When I see somebody's business card, but the more leads you collect, the more leads you have, generally speaking, the least money you make. Because what you're doing is you're not asking the tough questions and you're not drilling down on motivation and you're not drilling down and setting an appointment. What you're doing is you're just trying to somehow, you know, not ask the questions that are tough to ask, not cut through it to find out whether that leads motivated or not, and you're just dripping on them. And you're hoping that the drip campaign is somehow going to win them over and they're going to raise their hand and say, oh my gosh, Bob, these wonderful videos you've been sending me, I definitely want to do business with you. Life does not work like that. Now, it sort of did back in the 90s when these systems started to come to market, but now it's oversaturated. Everybody does it. Bob is not just in your drip campaign, but he's in 15 others, and all the emails are going to spam, and he's not reading any of them. I want you to really seriously question yourself 
if you think a drip campaign, if, if you've actually been sold into believing having a bunch of people in your database that you're dripping on, if you actually believe that's smart business, I think you really need to question that, okay? Now, here's the other thing. When it comes to centers of influence and past clients, I know everybody and their brother is going to tell you to do some long-term, you know, mail them, drop off pies, do all this other complicated stuff. Don't do any of that crap, guys. It, look, if you want to do it, fine, but do it after you've called them. Calling people is what makes you money. Calling people, getting on the phone is what makes you money. Why don't you do it? It's not because you're too busy. That's not true. You're not too busy. You don't do it because you are fearful of what to say and how to say it. That's the skills gap that you need to fill. Maybe we were, remember we were talking about that a second ago? So once you've filled that skills gap, making those phone calls is pleasurable. It's fun. Oh, and by the way, tremendously profitable. Well, so again, let's think about your centers of influence and past clients. How many of those, uh, you know, those people are in multiple agents lists? Remember, it's centers of influence and past clients. Oh, that's my past client. Nobody else can, you know, drop off pumpkin pies at their house. Well, I told you guys this story before. I'll tell you again because it is basically Thanksgiving week, and this is a funny story. So a lot of agents all over the country right now are busily, you know, packing their SUVs in their car trunks full of pies, and there's. There are companies that will basically sell you wholesale pies, Costco being one of them and companies like that. So I just, I've seen pictures on Facebook and other things of agents. They'll brag about, I ordered 400 pies and you see them picking up or having dropped off a pallet of pumpkin pies. It's, uh, I don't even know what to say. All right, then what? You have to deliver the damn things. So there's this, there was a story, uh, a coaching client. So we had a coaching client that did this pie routine. Um, always done it, convinced himself that he, him and his wife, that they still had to do it. So they're out dropping off pies. They would drop off pies every Saturday and every Sunday. They're a pie delivery business somehow is what they became. And they had a lot of centers of influence and past clients. They're involved in their church and they had three little kids and the whole thing. So they knew a ton of people dropping off pies to everyone. Everybody gets a pie. Well, so they're dropping off pies and then they're going to people's doors and they said, like, I don't remember the exact ratios of numbers, so I'm not going to make it up. But like several times on one day and then the following day and then the following day, they were dropping off pies at people's houses. And the people had multiple pies from other agents having dropped the same, you know, different agents having dropped off pies. Now, I think that's kind of funny, don't you? Whereas the reality of it was is if you would have just called them and wished them happy Thanksgiving and maybe, you know, done a little homework ahead of time, popped on their Facebook page and, and saw that Sally just learned to ride her bike or just whatever, right? Connect with them as a human. <laughs> if you just would have done that, you would have saved yourself all that time and money from having to be Mr. or Mrs. Pie. You guys get the point? I'm trying to make you laugh, but the reality of it is, is look at all these things that agents do that just makes life more complicated, that causes you to feel, what, overwhelmed and stressed. I wonder how many agents out there right now are just absolutely beside themselves panicking because they don't have but a week to get their pies delivered. I bet you there's more than one, don't you guys think? And see, this is the insanity that's entered into the industry because people don't want to do proactive lead generation. Oh, I don't like getting phone calls. I don't want to call somebody. Really? You don't like getting, you, well, who's actually called you? Who, when is the last time you actually got a call on your phone that wasn't political, by the way, right? That when was the last time you actually got a call from somebody that was your, you know, maybe your past insurance agent or your neighbor? When was the last time you actually got a call from somebody wishing you any sort of goodwill? It never happens, does it? Because everybody's gone digital and passive. Because everybody's been bought into the malarkey that that's how people want to be communicated with. They don't. What you need to do is take your centers of influence and past client list, for example, and you divide it by the number of days in a month. I'm giving you the whole past client center of influence system. It's very simple. And then you need to call those people on the same day every month. And there's scripts and whatnot that I'm not going to give you today because, frankly, I'm running out of breath and I got something else to do. But there's scripts that you say differently. There's sim it's a similar theme that you say to them every time you call. But that's it. And, yes, you can leave voicemails. But when you start developing a higher level of you know relationship with these guys where they know to hear your voice, they're going to start giving you referrals more than if you just dropped, me, dropped off forget-me-not seeds in April. Do you guys get my point here? So take whatever it is that you have been thinking is normal. And this is what Julie and I do this time of year for our business too. We write down essentially all of the things that we think we're absolutely rock stars at in our business, in the coaching business. And then we, then we look at those things and we say, okay, what if those things stopped working? What if those things weren't true? 
Like what if all of a sudden, you know, this form of lead generation that we do for our coaching business, what if that were to go away? Oh my gosh. And then all of a sudden you're starting to see how vulnerable you actually are. And that's, again, I make, Julie and I intentionally want to make ourselves uncomfortable when we don't need to be just for the sake of doing that annual exercise, just for the sake of not being caught by surprise. There'll still be plenty of surprises, but at least it won't be the ones that we checked ourselves on. And this goes back to realizing that a lot of the things that you've, the systems and the, you know, the ideas that you've built in your real estate business and in your life really are overly complicated. They've gotten to the point where it does cause you to feel overwhelmed and stress because you've made it too hard. You've, you know, maybe it worked 10, 20 years ago and it doesn't work now, but you keep doing it just because you've always done it. There's a lot of our lives that are like that. Isn't, isn't that interesting when you think about that? So listen, guys, I'm going to, obviously, we're going to try to finish off these points tomorrow and hopefully I'll have Julie back on the show tomorrow. We'll see. I think she has one more CE class. <laughs> Are we good? You know, again, listeners, if you're in Julie's PC class, I want you to message her. And I want you to tell her to stop being a procrastinator because she had two years to get this CE done and she procrastinates it until it's like almost exactly two years. And it's Texas, so there's a absolute boat ton of CE that she has to get done. So it's kind of funny as I was writing these points to share with you guys, I obviously had Julie in mind with a lot of this because it get, goes back to that whole procrastination, you know, perfectionism thing. But in her defense, who the hell likes doing CE? Not a fun activity ever, right? So listen, guys, if you want to talk to Julie and I about joining our EXP team, please do text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. I know a lot of you guys are looking to make a change uh, in your brokerage. I know a lot of you guys are thinking, well, I, you know, maybe I'm had my best year ever. Okay. My best year ever. How am I going to, you know, have another best year ever? Maybe it's time to switch brokerages. Or maybe you said, well, you know what? I had a good year. It wasn't a great year. It wasn't a terrible year. It was a good year, but next year I want to have a great year. Maybe it's time to switch brokerages. Or maybe you're new, or maybe you basically had a terrible year. Maybe it's time to switch brokerages. Talk to Julie and I about joining our EXP family. Um, you know what? We'd love to have you uh, choose us as to be your sponsors in EXP. Just text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. Hey, guys, thank you. I always like to overtly show gratitude towards all of you for continuing to make this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate agents. We are now being listened to on a regular basis in... 56 different countries, which is extraordinary. So thanks to all of you all over the world that are listening to our show. I really do sincerely appreciate it. I appreciate the feedback, the emails. Uh, Julie does as well in the texts. And thank you for continuing to make Harris Rules a bestseller on Amazon. And, and yes, it's still for sale on Barnes & Noble and all the other bookstores. It's called Harris Rules, over 400 five-star reviews. Um, and it is a perfect stocking stuffer. It is a very holiday-appropriate shade of green, the book cover is. So you guys have a fantastic fantastic day. I'll talk to you on the show. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.